Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are live. It's been a while since I uh, ha have done this. Uh, planned on originally doing this. It kept, we kept getting pushed back and back and back. But now, thankfully, I'm here. Uh, so hold on. I got to share this on Twitter. Uh, you and you. Yeah, I got to share this on Twitter. Uh, share. And announce that I am live on Twitter. So I'll explain what's going on. Uh, there's a Muslim apologist named Paul Williams who uh, did a lecture on the historical Jesus, quote unquote, at Oxford. Um, there we go. And um, I've got a tech someone. Let me just text them now. All right. So Paul Williams is a Muslim apologist. However, something interesting about Paul Williams, he has apostatized from Islam multiple times. He claims to be Muslim, and every couple of years he goes into like a fit and leaves Islam. And a thing that's interesting about um, <clears throat> about um, uh, Paul Williams, like he leaves Islam every few years. If you take a look at his current Twitter handle, it's free monotheist. He changed it to that after he apostatized from Islam last. But he went back to Islam and that's what he is now. Um, he now the other Paul and I, if you remember, we are big on quoting primary sources and not relying on scholars, right? And keep in mind, this is in the context of Catholic Protestant versus Orthodox debate where we rely on facts, on cold, hard facts. But when you throw Islam in there, it's a whole new ball game because they don't, they don't, um, they don't do apologetics that way. They, since they've, well, let's be honest, got no evidence for their faith, they, uh, they quote from scholars um, who have theories on how the New Testament urged who the real Jesus was. Now, when I say they rely on scholarship, they only rely on scholarship if it agrees with them. Okay? It, they only r rely on it if it agrees with them. If the scholarship does not agree with them, it's worthless. It's not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, and that's how Paul Williams operates. Again, Paul Williams, I have nothing against him personally. No one has the right, no one has my permission to insult the guy. But um, yeah. So um, let's uh, go and uh, respond to Mr. Uh, Paul Williams. Assalamu alaikum everyone, uh, it's my great privilege to introduce Paul Williams, who usually does the introducing himself. Now, Paul Williams uh, fell in love with li liberal scholarship. Now, the vast majority of Christians who read liberal scholarship do not convert to Islam. They either reject the conclusions of it for good reason and become a conservative Christian, they accept the conclusions of it and become a liberal Christian or an atheist or agnostic. Very few convert to Islam. I'll tell you why. Because normally when they take a look at another faith, they, they would approach it with the same mindset. But no, Paul Williams had to suspend that mindset when he embraced Islam. Because uh, if you... Uh, apply the super skeptical, rationalist, higher criticism to any faith, you, you know, insane demands 
all faiths are going to fail the test, right? Because it comes from atheism. And uh, Paul Williams is uh, basically takes a lot of atheistic presuppositions in his examination of, of Jesus, the Bible, and Christianity, not Islam, the Quran, or the Islamic Jesus. All right, let's uh, go. I want to share blogging theology. Uh, it only started two years ago, and mashallah, it's up to nearly 200,000 followers. I think your, your largest viewed video is like 600,000. Uh, making kind of theological content digestible for people from all different aspects yeah. of the world. He's going to be talking about global. Jesus and Islam probably for about 40 minutes. So a very personal story for Paul, yeah. having been a Christian early in life and then becoming Muslim later on through his exploration of Jesus in, in the scripture. Uh, so I'm going to leave it to Paul now. To, and there'll be questions uh, oh, yes. at the end, so please hold on. Until then, there'll be enough time. Thank you very much indeed. Assalamu alaikum to you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, question, the Q&A bit at the end is my favorite bit. So um, I, I really appreciate tough questions, you know, not these kind of... I don't know if we're going to get through all this today. It's about, I think it's about an hour and 15. Um... Again, we'll see how much time we have. I, I don't have to, to work tomorrow. It, it's a it's a holiday in my country, so it's a really hardball questions to be welcome. Um, so I'm going to start this subject. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say Jesus, well, then Isa. So I'm so just to use the English vernacular throughout the talk. Um, in my early twenties. By the way, where does the name Isa come from? That's not his name. If you, you talk to uh, Christians in the Arab world, they don't call Jesus Isa. That's a that's a name the Quran gave him. Who knows where it came? Hey, William. God bless. How are you? Uh, yeah. No, we're gonna. I'm gonna go through these claims and show how Paul Williams is very selective in his um, use of sources, use of scripture. I can't wait till he gets to Mark 10. He's gonna get torn in half in Mark 10. Anyway, let's not wait. Um, I was not a Muslim. I was not a Christian. And I remember one Sunday morning cycling back from an all-night party. Uh, back home in London, and I was cycling up um, at the main road in Islington, and it was a lovely day, perhaps it was in the summer, and I saw a beautiful church called St. Mary's. Uh, it's the Church of England, it's an evangelical church. And um, I like architecture, and so I thought, I stopped and look at this amazing edifice, this building, and uh, I went in, the doors were open, I thought I wasn't a Christian. And uh, I just, for no reason, just went in, and I remember having an experience then, which started my journey of faith, my spiritual journey, which led to today. <laughs> um, and I went into the building. Uh, I can't remember there was a service going on. I don't remember who was there, really. But because I encountered what to me seemed like a very powerful force, um, a, I can only use language which is inadequate, but uh, so I'm putting it in language which doesn't really do justice to it. But I felt this overwhelming sense of love. And it wasn't from within me, it was external. It was very powerful. And it was unwelcome. I, I really was not expecting this. I just, going home, I just popped into this church. How nice, Gothic architecture. Um, so I, this very powerful presence, and I actually couldn't take it. It was too much, and I kind of backed off and uh, left the building. And me being me, of course, I went back the following week for a repeat performance, and nothing happened. Of course, how do I understand what happened? Well, I, I, it began at the time. I thought well, this is very peculiar. Uh, church, love, powerful religious experience. Okay, well maybe I should look into this a bit. So I started to read the Bible because I've been brought up in a vaguely nominal Christian culture in Essex, where I'm from, an Essex boy, which if you know what that means is not the highest caliber <laughs> personage in the world, as I'm constantly reminded. Um, don't worry, I moved to London pretty quick. Uh, so um, so I, did, I did take that seriously, and um, I, I read, oh, that's it. I actually haven't prepared, I've forgotten about this, I actually read a book on um, 
Japanese mysticism by a Jesuit. I mean, kind of random subject. Uh, I thought this is kind of mystical. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like something. Uh, and then good. through that, I got into the Christian mystics, uh, you know, John of the Cross, Thomas of Kempis, a bit of St. Augustine, um, especially job. the imitation of Christ. Good job. You know, that's where he should have stayed. So he started out well, but... Um... By Thomas of Kempis. And I remember I was just obsessed with that book and St. Augustine, his book, I love confession. that book. Oh, man. It's got a long and very dry story short. Uh, um, I, I began to read the Bible, as I said, the New Testament. Amen. Completely unknown text to me. I had no idea what this book was, but I thought, hey, English. this is a religious book, I must read it. Um, and I started going to my local church, and I moved to London, and uh, uh, which was a West, Westbourne Park Baptist Church in Paddington, near where I live still. And um, the fellowship there was very loving, and they preached a God of love and all the other things that evangelical Christians preach as well. So I became a Christian about a year later or so. Uh, still reading the, the, the Gospels particularly interest me, so I got to read about the Gospels and what Jesus was like and what he said, what he taught. I uh, became a Christian, and because of me being me, I took a, a fairly intense interest in the text of the Bible, the Gospels. See, that's good. That's good to have an interest in the text. However, what you do with that interest, how you approach the text. I love the text of the Bible, but um, you're going to see this is where he goes off the rail. Uh, the letters of Paul as well. And, you know, I had no prejudice. I mean, I had the usual prejudices of a young person who was reading a, a Bible, but I had no hostility to the content. It was what it was. Uh, but I started to notice problems, what I thought were problems. Now, I came to believe, by the way, that Jesus was God. I believed in the Trinity, I believed in the Incarnation, I believed he died, God Amen. died for my sins. Uh, I believe all of that. For me, it was preached in a very beautiful story. It can be, if you get a really good preacher, you know, he can really stir up the emotions and get your heartstrings engaged. And, anyway, I believed it, I thought, what a, what a beautiful story. Um, but nevertheless, I was reading the Gospels and I noticed some problems. Um, and this sent me into books. Well, okay, if you think you come across a problem in the text, you uh, you consult books, but uh, he consulted the wrong book. Well, scholarship, basically. Looking for answers, there must be answers. Scholarship, modern, higher, higher criticism. Okay, I must, I must have, I'm sure the devil is behind my questions, you know, spiritual warfare trying to help me, trying to stop me believing. So I have to touch this, yes. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> um, so um, I... Uh, Nevertheless, I, I, went, I spoke to a couple of ministers, priests, about the problems I had. And then I met one of them, in a priest in London, an Oxford-trained scholar, I was told, and I went to him with my issue. And what, what is the issue? One of the issues, I'm not going to go into the details, because it's a bit, it's a bit textual and a bit you know, obscure, unless you're really interested in this sort of thing. If you read the Gospels, it looks like, on the first reading, that Jesus, uh, in Mark chapter 13, for example, and Matthew 24, and Luke 21, um, predicts the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in AD 70, which indeed happened. And then soon after, within the generation of people then living, the end of the world, the return of the Son of Man, and the end of all things, eschaton. I thought, hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, this is 2,000 years later, and we haven't had the eschaton, so Jesus made a mistake. That can't be true. You're right, and if your interpretation of that was correct, uh, the church wouldn't have got past the first century. But your interpretation isn't correct. And by the way, if that's true, if Jesus made a bogus interpretation, then he's a false prophet, which automatically falsifies any religion that believes he's a prophet. Christianity and Islam. Oh. Oh. Paul. 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 Be careful. He's God. So I went off and made biblical commentaries, and I've done a lot of biblical commentaries since then on this particular We're chapter in Mark 13. And I've, I, I discovered to my horror that this whole subject, it's called eschatology, apocalyptic eschatology, is a absolutely central aspect of New Testament studies, as taught here or in all universities, basically, in the world. And that people like Albert Schweitzer and Boltman and others had written great terms about it, and it's a big problem because the early church, many sections within it, clearly believed that the world would come to an end. Why does this matter? 
Well, they expected an imminent eschatology, the evidence suggests. In other words, the, the world was going to end he then. Did a couple come thousand. Back in judgment, obviously. He destroyed the temple. Years ago. But it didn't. You don't have to be a scholar to know that it can end because we're here. That's the trick. We're still here talking about it. So there's a whopping mistake right at the heart of the New Testament. So why do you still follow? A, so, so assuming that's true, why do you still follow a religion where Jesus is a prophet and Messiah? I mean, shouldn't you have gone looking to Judaism or Buddhism or, or something that doesn't have that? I mean, be, be consistent, Paul. I discovered to my horror. So what did I do as a Christian? Well, I became, to use perhaps an on PC word now, that's how I thought about it, I became schizophrenic in my mentality. I carried on being a committed Christian, praying, believing in Jesus God, and all, going to church. On the other hand, um, I kept on feeding on academic scholarship and learning more and more. And See, that's the problem. You took academic scholarships seriously. And by the way, w w when he finds something in academic scholarship that disagrees with Islam, he just ignores it. And that's going to come up. <laughs> that's going to come up in this pre presentation. Um, but no, we, you don't. You're not supposed to look to modern liberals. You need to look to the saints: Saint Jerome, Saint Venerable Bede. These are Thomas Aquinas, all these great Robert Bellarmine. That's who you need to look towards. Looking for not people like Rudolf Boltman and all these other um, frauds. Answers, and unfortunately, I discovered even more problems, which I wasn't even oh. aware of problems, but nevertheless were serious concerns for New Testament scholars. And I'm going to mention just one or two of them uh, this evening, by way of illustration. Now, you might be wondering what's got to do with Islam and Jesus, but it's part of my journey of faith, because Islam ultimately provided answers to many or all of these problems, which I didn't expect to have answered. And it was one of the key or major reasons, Jesus is one of the major reasons why Islam became uh, such a, an attractive option for me. Um, I thought Jesus made ago. a bold prediction. Um, so it's part of a journey of faith. Um, but before I get there, um, I just want to agree with you, um, share with you uh, a passage here. I don't know if we can get the... Can you just slide up there? Ah, excellent. Um, thank you. Um, I believe Jesus was God. And as I said, I was reading, this is a, a Bible, a nice red one. Uh, the New Revised Standard Version, this is the standard academic translation that you will find if you study the subject at Oxford or anywhere, really. It's the best English translation at the moment. Um, it, it is, of course, produced by Christians. Oh, yeah. And there's an interesting passage here, which is very well known. I'll just read a bit of it to you, and it might become self-evident to you what the problem is. This is Mark chapter 10. Uh, Mark is a gospel of the New Testament. Chapter 10 is uh, halfway through. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him, knelt before Jesus. What my good, good teacher, he said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Amen. Amen. You notice Jesus does not deny being good. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Don't defraud on your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, you're probably realizing the significance of that passage. Now, Mark is seen by biblical scholars now, as it has been for some time now, to be the earliest gospel, the first there's no evidence of that. It's all speculation. Extant gospel to have been written, and it was used by later writers, Matthew, for example, and Luke, uh, in writing their own gospels. And they added other material, which I'll come to in a sec, Q and whatever. But this is. 
Q is completely hypothetical. There's no evidence Q exists or ever did exist. The earliest Jesus tradition we have in Mark. And here we have a passage which shocked me. I thought, what? <laughs> Jesus is denying he's God. Where did he deny he's God in the passage? Now, the person he was talking to believed in that because he just called him teacher after that. But it's the guy who he exposed as a hypocrite. Jesus was asking him if he knew who he was. If he, and, and obviously he didn't know. Why did you call? Because it, it's a form of inquisitive dialogue. That's how a lot of people dialogue, especially it's the, the ancient Socratic method. That's how Jews talked. For me, God, a good, said Jesus. No one's good, but God alone. He's pointing away from himself as a humble Jew would. You know, as if like a Muslim would react and say, you know, oh, you're so good. Well, it's, uh, 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 goodness is a, belongs to Allah, it's an attribute of God. Don't use that word, so, you know. Where does he deny being good? Where does Jesus, he didn't say, don't call me good, no one is good, but God alone. I, I don't know what he, uh, and, and guys, he's quoting Mark 10, 17, 18. Mark 10 is one of the most, one of the most anti-Islamic chapters in the entire Bible. There's about four or five things in this chapter alone that fly in the face of Islamic b belief. Uh, I'm going to read them to you now. Uh, 10.2, and the Pharisees came up. And in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He, he answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and put her away. But Jesus said to them, for your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. Hence, Moses wrote the Torah that, that Christ had uh, in his day. Okay? Moses wrote that. The Muslims don't believe in that. The Quran actually believes in that, but the Muslims don't believe it. L long story there. Um, yeah, so that's the first thing. But then, uh, for your hardness of heart, he wrote you the commandment, but from the beginning of creation, uh, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and he joins his wife, and the two shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And um, this is verse 10. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So Muhammad made Zainab divorce his husband. Zainab's husband, so he could marry Zainab. But technically, she committed adultery, and since he's married to an adulterer, that makes him an adulterer as well. So, um, th therefore, uh, two things already that go against Islamic b belief. Um, let's take a look at two more things in uh... all right this is verse 32 and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid and taking the 12 again he began to tell them what was to happen to him saying behold we are going up to jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and after three days he will rise so um is that what the muslims believe that Jesus was handed over, killed, rose again on the third day? No, they don't believe that. They deny he was killed or crucified. It says that in the Quran. Let me show you another uh, problem uh, in Mark uh, chapter 10. Uh, 
And James and John, this is verse 35, the sons of Zebedee came forward to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us what, uh, they, they talk about baptism for a while, um, which is a problem for Muslims because they don't believe in baptism, even though uh, Jesus and John the Baptist are both their prophets and, and they taught it. And Jesus called them, uh, but it shall not be among you who, is verse 4 or 3, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So according to Islam, did uh, Jesus Christ give his life as a ransom for many? No. I mean, Mark 10 is one of the most anti-Islamic chapters in the entire Bible, and Paul Williams ignores it. He ignores it all. He just uh, He just takes the one verse he likes, and he spins that verse. A very pious Jew, a very pious Muslim, actually, might say the same. No, because Muslims don't follow the Torah. They don't follow the Torah. See, there's kind of a bait and switch. Because uh, Muslims like to say to Christians, well, Jesus followed the law and we followed the law. No, you have your own separate law. There may be the odd overlap, which you guys blow out of proportion. Uh, but... Um, yeah, no, it's 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 not Islamic. So if we understand this passage in its Jewish context, it makes perfect sense. If we see it in its Christian context later, it jars. Oh, how do we deal with this? You read it in at, at face value. <laughs> That's so how... how did the other gospel writers deal with this? I mentioned very briefly that the other gospel writers used Matthew and Luke in the writing of their gospel. There's no evidence for that. That's all speculation. Yeah. Oh, there we go. This is the only technical bit we're going to get in tonight's talk. You'll be glad to know. Uh, I thought if I didn't do this at Oxford, yeah, that would be really bad for us. Zero so, evidence. A bit of academic stuff. Um, this is called the two source hypothesis. This is the standard model that the vast majority of academics in the world will teach you, uh, probably in the first year, I imagine. That they have no proof for. Um, All speculation. So, what does this mean? Well, this is the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. There are four Gospels in the New Testament, and they used each used two sources, hence two source hypotheses. Uh, one of the sources is Mark, as I mentioned. So he fed into him, and he fed into Luke. And this other word here, which is a German word meaning, for German speakers, quell, is that right? Yes. Meaning source right. in German. Well, uh, it's the only well, German well, I know, well, well, and it happens to be from biblical studies. Anyway, so these two gospel writers, Mark and Q, use Mark and Q, I should say, in their gospel. You probably want Okay. Oh, well. You want these extra colors. Well, this is a special Mark, unique to Mark, and special Luke, unique to Luke. So Luke's gospel is made up of Mark, uh, Q, Quell, this other source, which is reconstructed from comparing Matthew and Luke, and this unique material from Matthew and Luke material for Luke. Uh, it's, called, it's called the two-source hypothesis. So why does this matter? Well, what we can do... All right, all right. Uh, there's no evidence for this. It's all speculation. But but I'm. have people thought about how improbable this is? All right, let's pretend it's the year 80 AD. I'm Matthew. I'm a Christian in Antioch, a leader in Antioch. And... I know there's a gospel of Matthew of, of Mark in circulation. I get a hold of it, and I'm like, huh, I like this. Yeah, I like this, but uh, it's got a bit of problem. I need to add the birth. I need to add a virgin birth. I need to add in some Q material here because I got my 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 stuff, my exclusive to M, my Q material, and I got to work it into Mark. And now that I, oh 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 the the, the, the Christology isn't high enough. I gotta gotta up the Christology here. Ooh, I don't like that theology. It makes Jesus look a bit weak. We gotta get rid of that. See how ridiculous this sounds? And then I gotta put mine into circulation 
knowing that Mark is in circulation and I've improved Mark, right? There is no evidence for anything Paul Williams says. It's all speculation. What scholars have done for some time now is that they can see, literally observe, how Mark has been changed, edited, embellished, corrupted by Matthew. And they can see how Luke has changed, corrupted, embellished, omitted, improved Mark as well. And the results when we look at this are stunning. Again, I'm not saying everything I'm telling you tonight about the Bible, I'm trying to give you the mainstream scholarly view. I'm not trying to give you some wacky marginal theory or anything like that. This, I'm trying to give you the sort of thing you might learn if you were to study this, uh, albeit in a more simplified form. So we know in Mark, in Mark 10, Jesus apparently denies he is God. No, he doesn't. Uh, he passage. God. So how does Matthew deal with exactly the same passage? Because let's say oh, he gobbles up all of Mark. Uh, and if you want to know afterwards, if anyone bothers to ask me, I can tell you how we know that. I'm not going to go into that at this precise moment. So in Matthew's version of Mark 10, we read the following. Someone came up to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he lists the same commands. An attentive reader or listener will notice a difference. Well, see, there's two ways you, you, you can go. You can go, it's a contradiction, or you can go, they're recording different parts of the the conversation, and you, you can merge them. And that's what people did in the early church. Eusebius, Augustine, they had all their collated version of the Gospels into one. Um, no, which no I happen to know by heart, so I'm not going to... Um, Mark says, Mark's Jesus says, why do you call me good? Matthew's Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? That's not the same words. Why do you call me good? Why do you ask me about what is good? What's going on here? Why has Matthew changed the words of Jesus? And the view of many scholars, including John Barton, Regent Professor of Venetia at Oxford, who I interviewed on my channel, as work there, if you want to watch it, very good. Uh, we discussed this, and his view is, which is remarkably blunt for a Christian, he's an Anglican priest, New, Test uh, New Testament oh, scholar, Old Testament biblical scholar, is that Matthew is being dishonest. That's the word he used, by the way. Well, he's being, uh, John Barton's being dishonest too by calling himself a Christian and a biblical scholar. Because no uh, Christian or tr a true Christian or true biblical scholar would ever say that. Why is he being dishonest? Because he's changed Jesus' words to remove the embarrassment of Jesus denying he is God. Embarrassing to who? To the early, to the church. The Gospels are written long after Jesus, towards the end of the first century. Mark about 17. But the Quran affirms them as the Injil that Christians must follow, Surah 5, 68. AD, Matthew and Luke, uh, 89, 90 AD. I'll come to John in a minute. It's a separate category. So Matthew has, it seems, and this is the, the standard view, because of the implications of Mark, Mark's Jesus, which is the earliest, changed Jesus' words to remove the embarrassment of a non-divine Jesus. And he's elevated his status. And this, in many other ways, Matthew has altered Mark to, as I say, heighten Jesus' Christology. In other words, his status, his nature, his Christology ontology. Christology is not high enough. I gotta, I gotta up the Christology. I hope you can see where I'm going with this. So, what do we have in there? Various hadith that speak to this, even you know, where the prophet, upon whom be peace, says, "Do not do to me what the Christians." have done to Jesus. I am just a man, just a messenger. You mean take him at uh, one of the most remarkable hadiths for a Christian, an ex-Christian like me. Obviously that's a Bukhari, I think it's a Bukhari hadith, set me aside. Um, so that, in a, in a very quick nutshell, is uh, the Gospels. Um, now, coming to um, John's Gospel, because I've left that out quite deliberately. John is, is by good book, it's his standard view in scholarship now for probably over 150 years. John is seen as a very different kind of gospel. It's independent of those other three, the synoptic gospels. It tells the story of Jesus very differently. He speaks very differently. He's constantly speaking about the relationship with the Son and the Father. 
it begins, you know, in the beginning. Well, the, the other Gospels do that too. Look at Matthew 11. No one knows the Father uh, except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father and those to whom the Son reveals him. Look at Matthew 11, relationship between the Son and the Father. I thought that was only John. Boo. The Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And you get these amazing I am statements. They're only found in one gospel, the entire Bible, the entire New Testament, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the resurrection. So, yeah, but see, the thing is, okay, all right, you could employ this kind of skepticism. And, but Muslim apologists will turn around and say that when Jesus talks about the paraclete, he's talking about Muhammad. Wait, I thought those were only in one gospel. How come we're re 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 relying on them? And if you're going to apply these standards, Paul Williams, how about where the Quran quotes Jesus predicting, prophesying the coming of Muhammad by name? What about that? Is that going to be just thrown out? Well, what about that, Paul? What about that? And the life, etc. You wouldn't dare. You know. Remarkable statements. They're not found anywhere else apart from this one gospel. It's the last to be written. So the the parable of the prodigal son is only in Luke. Does that mean we're we're only going to? Uh, discount it no you know just because it says something and again apply this to the statements of jesus in the quran towards the very end of the first century possibly even later depending on the scholars depending on who you believe um so scholars um have wondered how to reckon who was the real Scholar. jesus is he the jesus of mark who denies his good is the jesus of matthew or is he the gospel is he the jesus of john who is this very heavenly figure. Why does it have to be one or the other? I mean, all right, you got four Gospels. Like, I mean, like in my studies on the Fourth Crusade, I had multiple primary sources of the Crusade. I have um, uh, Geoffroy de Villehardouin, Robert of Clary, Gunther of Paris, uh, Neketus Cognatus, and a couple other sources as well. And how about I said, which is the real Fourth Crusade? No, they're all the Fourth Crusade. They just tell it from different angles, which is what the Gospels are as well. The, this whole idea of putting the Gospels against each other is is a very modern thing, and it's coming from a bunch of academics who are just trying to keep their job so they need something to publish about you know in in academia the motto is publish or perish so you have to hypothet make hypothetical all these things and who becomes incarnate and the word became flesh john 1 18 I think, word became flesh and dwelt among us he's the logos the logos of greek philosophy as well as uh the word you find in genesis in the beginning you know god created by his word he spoke in these things into existence so Jesus has become an otherworldly figure. Uh, he speaks differently. He sounds differently. It's not always easy to detect when Jesus is speaking, when John the Baptist is speaking. They all sound the same in terms no, of the well, idiom they, they speak. No, they don't. So scholars have come to the conclusion, and I would say, no matter what I say, let's see what one of the world's leading experts says on this. I want to quote him to you. It's going to be a liberal. Now, this is one of my, this is my first recommended book, The Historical Figure of Jesus by E.P. Sanders. Now, sadly, he died about two weeks ago. Um, he, he was um, probably the most uh, distinguished Jesus scholar in the world. Well, maybe one or two others could claim that as well, but an extremely brilliant scholar, American. Why not? Craig and he wrote this amazing book, The Historical Figure of Jesus. Uh, why not Craig Keener's biography of Jesus? Wh why not? Why don't you take him? Oh, because he's a conservative and he actually believes the text. So E.P. Sanders, and by the way, w when E.P. Sanders says something, Paul, that you disagree with, his opinion becomes as worthless as mine is in your eyes. Uh, I think it's Penguin. Yeah. Um, which is a classic. And it's amazing reviews by scholars on the back. 
So if you want a good introduction to the New Testament, the text, these issues I've been talking about, everything else, a good primary, good introduction. And he says, in conclusion, consequently, for the last 150 years or so, scholars have had to choose, choose between John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have almost unanimously... And, and, and by the way, guys, the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you want to put it that way, is not Islamic. Is not Islamic. And by the way, when they go for a prophecy of Muhammad, supposed prophecy of Muhammad in the Bible, where do they go first? They go to John, the paraclete. All of a sudden, John becomes 100% kosher. But if you use, if I try to use John to prove something else, John becomes worthless. I think entirely correctly concluded that the teaching of the historical Jesus is to be sought in the synoptic gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that John represents an advanced theological development in which meditations on the person and work of Christ are presented in the first person as if Jesus said them. So again, this is a very much top mainstream scholar. Another way of putting it, uh, there's a professor at King's College in London um, who, who's written a standard work on the gospel. Paul, the other Paul, not Paul Williams. You know what we're dealing with. This I, I said at the beginning that the other Paul and I have a mission. Get rid of the scholars. Use the primary or early sources. Use, use the evidence over scholars. The more you quote scholars, the more weak your position looks. And again, Paul Williams, when he disagrees with the scholars, scholarly opinion becomes worthless. And, and this is going to come up. He says that about the I am statements, the way to read them, he thinks, and he's also a Christian, is that when oh. Jesus says, the words are put on Jesus' lips, I am the light of the world, for example, we should read that as John saying, I believe that he is the light of the world. So these are confessional statements of John, the author of the fourth gospel, rather than historical statements from the historical Jesus, the real Jesus. Now, he didn't have a problem with that. He's just being very clever. But I think the average person in the pew, when told that by their own scholars, that Jesus almost certainly did not speak like this, did not say these things, would be shocked to the core. And there was I, as a Christian, reading this stuff. Can you imagine what it did to my... Well, first of all, um, first of all, if, if you apply that standard to Islam as well, Islam goes out the door. Um, but second of all, why put any stock in this stuff? It's worthless. Like John Kolarafi says here, it doesn't begin well or end well. So I just put no stock. Th these are kooks. It's, it's the same people telling me, uh, saying the Big Bang is true, yet the Big Bang has so many, uh, uh, so, so many patches on it. Oh, yeah, the Big Bang, it's a great model. Well, you got to add 95% of the universe is dark matter, dark energy. You need to add spatial curvature. You need to increase the speed of the reaction. It's... Yeah, no, it, it's it's all patchwork, you know. Therefore, I don't take them seriously, just like I don't take these quote unquote scholars seriously. Faith. So I became well. I then understood myself again in those on PC days. <laughs> I saw myself as, as a disabled Christian. I couldn't walk properly. I, you know, I couldn't walk in in a Christian way. I was crippled. And you know how you cure that? You say these people are a bunch of wackos. So don't take them seriously. Was it John Dominic Croson who said that when critical scholars search for the score called Jesus, they fundamentally just find a reflection of themselves? You know, I've heard that statement. That, that statement has been said before. I don't know if it was John Dominic Croson. Uh, Crossing, but whoever said it is 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 correct. I'd say so. If it is uh, John Dominic Crossing, 
who also is a wacko liberal. Yeah, just, um, yeah. To use that language, which I wouldn't use now, although I just did. Anyway, <laughs> um, you get my point. Um, so I, 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 I was not functioning properly as a Christian. You know, I went to priests and whatnot, and the more I looked into it, the worse it got. It, uh, it didn't kind of heal itself or become solid. When I first read that stuff, I recognized that this is garbage. And then I rejected it, and I went to read writings from the actual saints. Why doesn't he read Brant Petrie's book, which gives solid, logical, and answers based on evidence to all of this liberal garbage? Brant Petrie, The Case for Jesus. I'm trying... The, the whole reason I'm looking over there is because I know it's in that shelf somewhere. Anyway, it's called The Case for Jesus. Um, the Case for Jesus can pretty much r r refute the whole lecture that Paul Williams gives gets at the presuppositions and tears them in half. And if you're a, a Muslim who's doing honest inquiring, a Muslim or a secularist, I would recommend The Case for Jesus. It's a great book. It shows the, the reliability of the New Testament, the deity of Christ in the synoptics, why we can trust the authorship, yeah, but, but he hasn't read Augustine, save maybe the confession or something like that. He hasn't read Augustine. He reads uh, John Barton and all these, and E.P. Sanders. Augustine was just some fundamentalist guy who lived in a, who, 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 who lived in a day when people were so stupid, they actually believed something. Anyway. I know what you mean, though. Because I learned a terrible fact, and this is not known by me. You were presented an, a terrible opinion, and you accepted it as fact. Many Christian, by most Christians in the world, I don't mean Christians in this university, but perhaps well, maybe here too, I don't know. But globally, on average, there is a huge gulf, a chasm, between the man and woman in the pew, the ordinary Christian, so to speak, and the scholars. The ulama of Christianity. Oh, the ulama. Well, it depends what, like the, the scholars today? How about Augustine? How about Jerome? How about Aquinas? How about St. Robert Bellarmine? How about um, Cornelius Lapide, the, big, the great Jesuit exegete from the 16th and 17th century, back when being a Jesuit he used to mean something. Um, and what they know, I've been saying for years now, since what they know, what they is so different. What they have discovered, and they made some extraordinary discoveries about the Bible, are simply are not known about by Christians in general. Why is this? I remember Bart Ehrman, the American scholar, asking this question. In fact, I asked him myself this question. He's written about it. And there are many reasons. One, priests, by the way, and ministers and pastors who teach these in these churches, they've been trained by these academics, like Wycliffe Hall. They learn about this stuff, but a lot of them think it's just junk. Like my priest at my church, he knows about this stuff, but he thinks it's junk. He's like, yeah, I learned Raymond Brown. It's a bunch of garbage because in Catholic circles, you're going to learn Raymond Brown. It's like, yeah, it's a bunch of trash. Okay. That's why. It's good that the people in the pews don't know this stuff. They should be studying the scriptures and, and, and Christ and, and focus on their prayer life, not people who uh, are just inventing stuff with no evidence. And by the way, again, I'm going to say when these people contradict what Paul Williams believes, he rejects their opinion. So there's nothing noble about what Paul Williams is doing. Whereas for me, I reject it wholesale. And I only believe in true scholars of the Bible, people like St. Jerome. People like Venerable Bede, Aquinas, uh, Cornelius Lapide. Those are my scholars. 
because they have the same view as me when it comes to the scripture. The same view an Orthodox Muslim has when they approach the Quran. So. Here in Oxford, the Evangelical College, I've known about it for years, they train ministers. And the ministers know what I've just said because it's standard. They know that people have said this. Does that mean they believe it? I think there's very good reason not to believe this stuff. And yet, what do they do when they get to their churches and, and they get to their, 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 their little old lady in the pew, so to speak? And it usually is little old ladies in the pews these days, unfortunately, because no one else goes, bless them. Uh, they don't go because the faith has been watered down because people have bought into this higher criticism. Garbage. Unlike in mosques. Anyway, it's another story. Yeah, the, that's cute, but there, I, I don't think there's as many people in mosques as Paul Williams thinks there is. Um, Although it's certainly more than the churches in England, though. So. The priests don't say anything. The ministers don't say anything. Why? Because maybe they're afraid to lose their jobs. I mean, just be frank, because they're salary, usually. Or maybe they just don't buy into it. They haven't been snowed like you have. You've been snowed, Williams. They haven't. Maybe that's why. Or they they don't want to damage the faith of quote unquote simple believers. Very patronizing, but that's also probably an attitude. Or also maybe they don't have to you don't know how to communicate, vocalize these issues to quote unquote ordinary people who are often very qualified in other areas. They may have degrees in engineering or chemistry or whatever. Um, so there's a massive failure to communicate these facts to the facts. average so-called average person. facts. They're facts. They're taught by some academics and therefore they're facts. No, these are opinions, opinions that should be rejected and opinions that Paul Williams, you should re re reject. And you do in a lot of cases because these people don't agree with Islam. But yeah, no, th that's why. Sure, they learned this. I mean, say I decided to read the book i i wouldn't do this say someone decided uh, uh the, 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 that i should read 50 shades of gray so i read that trash and it's like how come you're not telling everyone about this alan well because it's trash you, you know i'm ashamed to have even read it that's what should happen and in fact it is more it is better for the soul to read Fifty Shades of Grey than to read these academics. Because at least Fifty Shades of Grey doesn't claim to be a Christian book. What Paul Williams wants you to read is spiritual Fifty Shades of Grey. It's like, why don't the people in the pew know about the spiritual Fifty Shades of Grey? Well, because the priest is, is saving them from that. <laughs> Christian. And that's an intellectual and spiritual scandal, in my opinion. But that's not my problem anymore. Uh, I'm glad to say. Um, so, um, now another quick distinction. Let me just check the time. Okay, I'm gonna have to speed on a bit, actually. Um, another thing I learned uh, from my studies, and again, nothing I'm discovering is my discovery. It's, it's out there, if you want to discover it, is, you know, Muslims talk about the Injil. The, gospel, uh, the Quran talks about the Injil. The Quran thought the Christians at the time of Muhammad had the Injil. Again, uh, take a look at Surah 5. 16. So God gave Jesus the Injil, or in English, the Gospel, the Evangelium. Um, if you look at what that Gospel is in the Synoptics, so what did Jesus go around actually preaching? And you compare that with the gospel that Paul, who's a guy in the New Testament who wrote letters to the Romans and Galatians and Corinthians and so on, you compare these gospels, the same word is used in the Greek Evangelium. Um, they're actually quite different. In the earliest gospel material, Jesus is not preaching about himself. He's preaching about the kingdom of God. He's teaching a message of spiritual and moral renewal. Where does uh, the kingdom of God feature in the Jesus of the Quran. Oh, we better reject him because of that. See, Paul Williams is re rejecting it now because he's not applying it to his book. So don't, don't be so concerned, like some kind of legalistic, I was going to say Salafi, that would be unfortunate, legalistic <laughs> Muslim who, um, I wasn't say, 
No, it's unfair, because the Salafis I know are actually very nice people. Um, but a, a bad Salafi, bad Salafi, uh, who's obsessed with obeying the law, the Sharia, in a particularly kind of legalistic way, and not really concerned about ethics so much, and the heart, all those things that are also part of Islam, of course. And I would argue that Jesus was attacking the Pharisees who are concerned with what they call exterior righteousness, you know, white and sepulchres, the idea of a, a whitewashed tomb, it's all very clean on the outside, but inside it's full of rotting bones. It's actually a metaphor that Jesus uses in the synoptics. So he's criticizing this hypocrisy, you know, oh, I'm good, I fast, you know, I fast during Ramadan, I pray five times a day. Actually, I'm a horrible person, but hey, I fast and pray, you know. <laughs> hey, is, is this pleasing to Allah? No, it's not, we know this. Niat, niat uh, rather, it, 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 its intention is the right intention is absolutely key to you know our, our prayers being accepted by God. So um, Jesus is attacking that, uh, I think, uh, and bringing some compassion and love into the Sharia of his day, which is the Halakha, the Sharia Jewish law, the six hundred thirteen commandments of, of Mount Sinai from the given to Moses. So, so amongst all what I've just said, is a contrast coming out. We have the gospel of Jesus, where Jesus went around preaching, and we have the gospel about Jesus. Oh. So Paul, Paul is a, um, he calls himself an apostle. Let me give you an example of what he preached uh, about Jesus. Um, taking from the book of Acts, which is a story about basically Paul and his journeys around. Oh, by the way, the book of Acts is written by the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke, a synoptic gospel. The ancient world. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 13, the, the jailer in Philippi, he was jailed. Uh, he said to um, uh, Peter and Paul, he said to uh, Paul, um, what must I do to be saved? I'm supposed to have a slide for this. Oh, it's actually, it's on there. It's not, oh, there. Hmm. Okay, we don't want that. Uh, cancel that. Oh, what must I do? There we go. Nice bit of water on my life. Okay. Um, what must I do to be saved? Uh, he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's how you're going to be saved. Believe in Jesus. Have you heard preachers say that? I have. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. Remember what Mark said. Well, that's not really so different than what Mark, uh, of course, when he says believe in Jesus, it means follow his commandments, obviously. That's kind of an all-encompassing believe. Um, th th that's easily the context of that. Now, Paul Williams is going to go back to, I think, Mark 10 and be like, oh, he says keep the commandments. But like, if you believe in Christ, you keep the commandments. I came up to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good knowing? Obey the commandments. And he lists the commandments. And he says, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. That's the injury of Jesus. The gospel of Paul is something else, I would argue. That's my view. Because they're two different religions. I mean, you can't have two different ways of salvation. I mean, you can't have... It's like a Muslim would say... You know, uh, there's a classic book called Not By Faith Alone by Robert Sengenis. And he uh, he starts the book with talking about the, that uh, in Acts 16. The Philippian jailer. And from that, he goes into a, an entire 700 page examination on the doctrine of justification. There's a lot more to that because then he baptized him after. And how come his family's saved if he believes? Oh, is there some kind of headship there? What role does baptism play? Well, what about the other commandments? In fact, in fact, it, it, it's so simplistic. He takes a single verse from Paul. L let me... Um, I'm going to pop open the old Bible here. Romans.
Romans 3.28, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Wow. Well, that goes against Christ. But yet, at 2.13 it says, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Who is that? Is that Jesus or Paul? That's Paul. Paul's stuff is not the kind of simplistic stuff where you can just read one thing and say, oh, that's Paul. But that's what he's showing his audience, which is mainly a Muslim audience who hasn't read the Bible. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, you know, there's much more to it than that. How do, how do I be saying, well, believe in Muhammad? No one would say that. I mean, I'm not, you know the answer, so I'm not going to give the answer. But that's not Islam. And it's not, it's not Jesus Gospels of Jesus either. So that was a quite a, a shocking uh, discovery as well. Um, what's the next slide? I've done that one. Oh yeah. Oh yes, that one. <laughs> um, right, let's move on to Islam. So um, this is the my, my pe most painful bit about telling my story. I'm not proud of it, but um, it's, nevertheless it's part of it. I became, as a Christian, increasingly um, Islamophobic, fearful. Um, Why? I live in Maida Vale, it's in central London, near the Edgewood Road. And if you know that area, you may or may not, um, it's becoming increasingly Arabized, or what I thought was Islamized. Actually, a lot of these Arabs are Christians in Syria. You know, I mean, look, just a picture from Syria, it doesn't mean you're a Muslim, you know, obviously. Or even anything, it could be an atheist. Um, anyway, in my own I, I never actually, to my knowledge, manifested this in words of behavior. I guess he was not Islamophobic, but Arabic phobic. And besides, I thought the vast majority of the, the Muslims in UK are not Arab. They're Pakistani, from India, Bangladesh, Somalia. I'm sure there's some Arabs, but you, you, you know, it's mainly Pakistan, India. But nevertheless, that certainly, I was feeling increasingly alarmed. Um, and I, I began to scare myself, as only I can do. You know. So I, I decided to go to my, not possessed me to do this, but I decided to go to my local mosque and actually talk to the Muslims there and find out, you know, what's going on? What, what do you believe? Just Because I kind of knew in the back of my mind that me didn't always accurately report religious affairs. I knew that as a Christian. So I went to Regent's Park Mosque, uh, my local mosque. I still go there now. It's, it's where I said by Shahada. And uh, I was a Christian. And I remember arguing and debating with some very patient Muslims. And um, <laughs> I read the Quran, or what I thought was the Quran, because it was an English translation. Um, but I used to get some sense of the interpretation and meanings of the Quran. Um, and I discovered something amazing uh, I didn't know existed, and it's this thing called Islam. I know, I know. Which I knew nothing about. I mean, real Islam, not the Islam of the Daily Telegraph, or the Daily Mail, or the Fox News. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, if you w w want to learn about Islam, read the Quran. Just like if you want to uh, learn about Christianity, read the Gospel. Don't read E.P. Sanders or some fraud like that. Read the Gospels. Which is not quite right, so often. Um, so, and this amazed me because I also discovered uh, something that I was really even more amazed about is a life of a man called Muhammad, upon whom be peace. And that was a revelation and a half. I said, wow, this guy was, if I use that language, excuse me, was absolutely extraordinary. And his life, the seer of the prophet, was no. absolutely extraordinary. I won't, I, and we begin to. Well, I mean, the way I would take a look at Islam is how I would look about something like. Napoleon, right? You know, maybe he accomplished a lot from a political standpoint, but in terms of being a prophet by biblical standards, he's not a prophet. He's a false prophet by biblical standards, by the standards of Jesus Christ, by the standards of the synoptic gospels he claims to care about. To recount it, you will know what it is better than I am sure. But uh, this was, I thought, why have I never been told about this man before? How extraordinary. So the question was, was he a prophet of God? So I don't know, you know, okay, was he a prophet of God? I came to the conclusion, reluctantly, that he was. Because if I knew about Moses and he didn't talk, and I knew about Jesus, and this man after him, after them, said and taught pretty much the same things, 
I mean, he really did teach the similar things. No. No. Where does... It says nine times in the Bible to love your neighbor as yourself. Where does Muhammad or the Quran teach that? Where does Muhammad say to be baptized or celebrate the Lord's Supper or say the Our Father prayer? Our Father, that's at every Catholic Mass, you'll hear the Our Father. The prayer that Christ gave in the synoptics. Hadith, particularly, and obviously the Quran. By what right, by what standards of justice could I possibly deny that he was a prophet of God? It was just a no brainer. But the inhibition in me was cultural, because I knew that I would cross over a cultural line from white middle class English to whatever was that, you know, Muslim. Muslim. A minority. From being a majority, I become a minority if I was to embrace Islam. And of course I did. Alhamdulillah. Um, anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, I said my shahada. And um, that was the beginning of an extraordinary journey. And boy, have I done some stupid things. Um, and Alhamdulillah, I've experienced some amazing things and learned so much. It's been a huge learning curve. Um, I just wanted to read you this quote, which I lost. Uh, it's quite, si uh, quite significant, I think, um, in my ju journey. Um, now, Hans Kuhn, by the way, who just died also a matter of weeks ago, uh, if you're a German, you will know who he is. Liberal. Uh, a very famous uh, a German academic, a thorn in the side of Ratzinger. Uh, of common sense. Uh, he was otherwise known as Benedict XVI, who died recently. A much more liberal, uh, even pro-Muslim, actually, voice in German in the German church. Although he's Swiss, to be technical, but he's also very popular in Germany. The German-speaking Swiss. Very popular. Um, very charismatic. Well, that might explain something in the German church. Charismatic figure. He ended up teaching theology at the University of Tübingen, which is that's a great university, isn't it? Uh, and, yeah. Uh, it's an amazing university. Anyway, um, he wrote a book called Islam Past, Present, and Future, reviewed somewhat critically by Abdul Hakim Murad at Cambridge, I hasten to add, but anyway. Um, and he says something very interesting, which is key, I think, to my own personal journey. Uh, so Hans Kuhn, who's a Catholic priest, by the way, said, and theologian, lines lead from the very earliest, the very first Jewish Christianity to the seventh century, indeed to Islam. The analogies between the Quranic picture of Jesus and a Christology with a Jewish Christian stamp are perplexing. He says, an interesting choice of words, perplexing. Me, it's a hundred of him, perplexing. Well, that's right. Anyway, these parallels are irrefutable and call for more intensive historical and systematic reflection. And this is a very academic way of pointing to an obvious truth. That if you look at the earliest Christianity, this is anachronism because Christianity exists in Jesus' time, that was a later thing. If you look at the earliest believers in Jesus, what are we talking about? They, um, and I can go into the evidence in Q&A if you want, but just very, 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 very briefly. They believe that Jesus was a man. They believe he was the man. Of course he was the Messiah. Man. They believe he was yeah. sent by God. They believe that God worked miracles through him. There we go. Uh, they believe that he was a great teacher, and they believed he was just human. Stress. Uh there were uh, a couple of those, but like the people like the Abianites aren't Islamic because they deny the virgin birth and they believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. So Hans Kung is wrong, and so is Paul Wilson. Stress. That was some of the key aspects. I, I, I mean, if you ignore large swaths of evidence, yeah, sure, you can say that, but... Um, and I think he's playing a bit on the ignorance of his uh, his his audience, who have never read this stuff. Paul Williams knows the Abianite aren't Islamic. Of the Kerygmas, it's called, of the earliest Christians. And they were Jews. They were Jews. They weren't like us today. I mean, like the vast majority of Christians today are not Jews. And if you look at the Christianity of the anachronistically... M Muslims aren't Jews. Of the aren't earliest they? community. And you look at the Quranic picture of Jesus. Who is Jesus in the Quran? He's a man underlined. He is a prophet. He's sent by God. He does miracles by God's permission. 
He is the Messiah. And he's born of the Virgin Mary. That's also an early Christian. And he prophesies Muhammad by name. By the way, the, uh, the uh, Bionites don't believe in the, uh, the virgin birth. Belief. And he was not God, as I've already just said. So the, the analogies between the Quran and Jewish Christianity are perplexing. For him, of course, is a problem because he's a Christian. And we must do more intensive study. Yeah, OK. Study away. But the, the evidence is there. It's clear. In a, in a sense that I would now put it, you can say without being in any way anachronistic that Jesus was a Muslim prophet, actually. A no. Muslim understood in the correct Quranic sense. I don't mean in the sense of post Muhammad, if you like. I mean in the, in the generic sense of a, a prophet who submitted his will to God. And there's plenty of evidence that Jesus did that. Quote endless verses in the Gospels. So Jesus is very much at home in Islam. And actually, in my belief, he's not at home in Christianity. I know that sounds weird. How can Jesus not be at home in Christianity? Because what they have done to him is not what he would have liked. I think... He yeah, if you Basically, you ignore all the evidence. You accept some wacko theories of liberals. There's no way in heck you can make Jesus Islamic. Like, when I go to church, I hear verses from the New Testament, from the lips of Christ, in the liturgy. Where is that in the Islam? We celebrate Holy Communion. Where have you done that, Paul Williams? When's the last time you did that? When you were Christian. Baptism. When do Muslims baptize? When do Muslims say the Our Father, the prayer Jesus told us to say? In the synoptics, again. He would have been, at best, horrified at what has happened to him. The way people had elevated him to an absolute status equal to that of God himself. Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. That's the earliest, one of the earliest sayings we have. And that statement in Mark 13, by the way, is seen by many, many scholars as some of the most reliable material in the New Testament. Why? Because the... Why do you ignore the rest of the chapter then? Remember, we went through the chapter, and it's a very non-Islamic chapter. The early church could not have invented it. Why would the church of the 60s, 70s, and 80s have invented a saying like that, it's which is so it. contrary it's to the beliefs it. of the second generation Christians who produced the Gospels? Why would they credit Jesus with statements which are clearly against their own creed? No, so the chart, this is called the criteria of dissimilarity. Or the criteria of it supports our creed. So it's very, very likely to be authentic. And if it's very likely to be authentic, in my view, that puts a fundamental question mark against the whole of the Christian understanding of the Trinity and Incarnation. Christians, Trinitarian Christians, have been reading Mark chapter 10 for 2,000 years, and there's no problem with it. Um, so, and the time is quarter two, very conscious of the time. Um, so, in um, conclusion, um, I just want to read uh, a passage from a book. Um, now, this book, I always flog this, but I don't flog it, I recommend it, um, by Guy Eaton. Guy Eaton is uh, a diary about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago now. Uh, he was an English convert to Islam. Um, Tim Winter uh, at Cambridge, who's probably Britain's most eminent scholar, Islamic scholar, called him the grandfather of Islam in England, the grandfather of British Islam. Not Abdullah Quilliam? <laughs> yep, that's, I, I, I give him that. Um, and he also worked at Regis Park Boss for many years. And I, I, I never met him. I think I did see him once, but I never met him, unfortunately. And his books, uh, this is probably his most famous, Islam and the Destiny of Man, are, are highly esteemed and treasured by particularly reverts, horrible word, converts to Islam. Um, no, revert sounds like a condition. Um, Revertitis. I embraced Islam. Um, and this one was the first book I read about Islam, I mean by a Muslim, um, back in, oh, you've got the date of it. And uh, he writes like an angel. And he is what I call bilingual. So he knows all about the Western, Western tradition, he knows about Christianity very, very well. And he also had been a Muslim for 50 years when he passed away. And he became a spokesman for uh, Islam in England and globally because of his reputation. He appeared on the BBC and whatever. 
um, these talks were serialized. You can still hear them online. Anyway, this is, is my, in my view, is magnum opus, his great work. Um, I do recommend it, particularly if you have friends, I mean, even for Muslims, I recommend it because it's, it's been a great favorite for, uh, it goes through the serial, he goes through the nature of the Quran and misunderstandings between the West, inverted commas, and the Muslim world. Uh, and he talks about the Akira and art and this, I mean, it's just, with great, great eloquence and education, and with I've never read uh, that amazing book, beauty. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. Um, so I do recommend this book. If you've got a, it sounds all things to say, but you've got an educated, educated friend, a friend who can, you know, uh, this book is ideal if you want to learn about Islam. Now, I do say these days, my views have changed a little bit. I don't necessarily agree with everything he says. Uh, I suppose if there's Why any not? health warning about the book, uh, he's a perennialist. I mean, we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, I'm not a friendless, uh, I'm a supersessionalist, to use the jargon. Um, so I think that's a mistake. Uh, but you know, hey, I think the vast majority of it, and this is where Salafis and I disagree because they wouldn't touch this guy because there's some issues with his Aqidah. And I, I understand why they're saying that, and they're right in a way. But I would say there's so much good in this book that despite some of its errors, it's still worth reading. And I'm trying to make that more complex judgments. And if you want to have a more black and white judgment, that's equally fine, actually. So I'm not saying you have to like it. Anyway, I recommend uh, this book. And he says on page 59 about Christians. As Muslims see it, Christians have been so possessed and overwhelmed by the splendor of their prophet, Jesus, as to compromise the divine transcendence. And in their cultivation of personal piety, they have allowed human society to slip away from righteousness, leaving the conduct of worldly affairs to secular forces, indifferent to the priority of eternal norms. <clears throat> it has become necessary to redeem the situation, not because there were some there were shortcomings in the message brought by Jesus or in the message brought by Moses, but because what had men was what had men had made of these revelations in the course of time and the manner in which the balance characteristic of every divine message had been disturbed. A final and unambiguous statement of the truth was therefore added to what had gone before, delivered, with, by, delivered by a messenger of God who would interpret it and live it with undeviating precision. We know who that is. And he goes on. That's just one oh, short not. paragraph where he surveys the move from Christianity to Islam. Why was Islam necessary when we had Christianity? And that is an answer. So I uh, recommend uh, that book. And okay, just notice the time. Um, I'll now just mention um, a few books that I would recommend oh. um, if you want to take this further. Uh, just three or four books. Um, this book is called The Islamic Jesus. Um, Trash. Oh, wait. Is that the um, Mustafa Akil's book? Come on, come on. Don't be shy. Okay, it's. Um, for some reason it's not budging. Anyway. I don't know what you do. What? No, oh, okay, it's wanting me to join things. Anyway, it's a matter. Um, Islamic Jesus by Mustafa Akiol, who I've had the pleasure oh, yeah. of interviewing on both. Yeah, he, he seems like a nice guy. I read that book. I got to admit, he's pretty honest with the evidence. It's more, it's a lot more honest than I think. Is he fully honest? Probably not, but a lot more honest th th than I thought. Theology about his, this book. Um, I, I will say as a kind of caveat, he has a number of beliefs, nothing to do with this book, which I don't agree with. He's Warning, Paul, St. Paul's the bad guy in that book. I bet you didn't see that one coming. An American person who's associated with a more liberal modernist tendency. I park that on one side because I don't think that has affected his, this book at all. In fact, this book is excellent, in my view. Is how the king of the Jews became a prophet of the Muslims, the Islamic Jesus. And if you want a pretty scholarly exposition of um, the Muslim understanding of Jesus, uh, he, he does not have a, uh, as far as I know, he doesn't have a degree 
in either Christian or Islamic studies. I think he's uh, a Turkish American. He's like a commentator, political commentator, and he like thinks Islam should be compatible with democracy. And he he thought that the Hagia Sophia should be a thing where the Christians use it Sunday and the Muslims pray in it on Friday, which is, you know, I appreciate the noble peacekeeping effort, but let's be honest, you can't do that. This the crowning Jesus, Islamic Christology, the second coming, what Jesus can teach Muslims today, etc. I really recommend this book as a good entrance. And at the beginning of each chapter, he has some wonderful quotes. I like this one from another German scholar. Germans feature a lot of them. I don't know why. Um, by a German professor of uh, religious history and philosopher, is it Hans Joachim Schweppes? I can't even mispronounce that. Anyway, here is a paradox, said this German Christian, of world historical proportions. Jewish Christianity indeed disappeared within the Christian church. The original Jewish Christianity disappeared, but was preserved in Islam. Wow. That's so Islam crazy. continues yeah, the heritage, we looked at it in the secular terms, of the earliest Christian beliefs. I think that's true. Anyway, the Islamic genius I recommend that. Uh, <coughs> I haven't touched on the crucifixion issue. We have Q&A, we can discuss it then. But there's one book yeah. I know in English. I think it's the only book that's ever been written on the crucifixion and the Quran. It's a study in the history of Muslim thought by Todd Lawson. And then some of my friends have actually read this as part of their studies I've at the East University. It's Professor at the University of Toronto, where my friend here is a student. Um, this whole book is dedicated to discussing uh, this verse, one verse in the Quran, I think it's chapter 4, verse 157. You know, he wasn't crucified, they would appear, they would appear to them that he had been uh, crucified. Uh, he was raised to God. I mean, I won't go into that now, I don't have time, I wanted to, but I just don't have time. So this is the, probably the best single English work on the subject of what's going on in that book, the different interpretations that Todd uh, Wilson talks about in Islamic history. Um, one more general introduction um, to Christian beginnings from Nazareth all the way up to uh, the Council of, uh, Council of Nicaea, or by Constantine, of course, in the fourth century. Uh, this is an excellent book called Christian Beginnings from Nicaea, uh, from Nazareth to Nicaea, by Giza Vermesh. Uh, Giza Vermesh was, uh, Thank you, you might know, a professor at some university from Oxford. Oh, that's here, isn't it? Yeah. Professor at Oxford in Jewish studies. Um, and uh, he was an interesting life. He was Hungarian, Jew, um, and uh, converted to Catholicism in Hungary in the 1920s. And um, sadly, even converting to the Catholic Church didn't save him from Hitler. So he escaped from. Uh, Nazi-occupied Austria, obviously, uh, and ended up here, literally here, at this university, uh, where he uh, was a professor of Jewish studies, and he became the world's probably leading, well, he was the world's leading expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He translated them into English, he was fluent in Aramaic, and Hebrew, and English, and Greek, and you, know, you name it, he was an expert. So that's what he's associating with uh, his fame. But he's also a Jesus scholar of the highest order, and, and this book um, looks at Christian beginning. So his understanding of what happened historically, how Jesus became uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, um, is very yeah. Islamic, actually. I mean, he's a Jew. He's a Jewish guy. He left his Catholicism, by the way. He, he left being a priest and went back to being a Jewish believer. Um, but anyway, he's yeah. a reconstruction of what really happened. Uh, he's very compatible with Islamic understanding of uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Jesus. If you ignore all the um, And lastly... Um, oh, by the way, why did he become a Muslim then? Why didn't he become a Muslim? That makes no sense. If it's... Oh, it's... If they, they see, and they see that the earliest stuff is very similar to... How come they don't become Muslim? It's one of my uh, favorite books. Um, this is it's a bit niche, this, but it's really important. Uh, it's called The Brother of Jesus and the Lost Teachings of Christianity. Now, we haven't been uh, lost. Uh, the, the Brother of Jesus referred to here as a guy called James, or Jacob, or you know, various kind of versions of that. And amazingly, all the historical records are very clear that after Jesus disappeared from the scene and ascended into heaven, 
who was a leader of the church in Jerusalem? Everyone says, oh, it's Peter, you know, the first pope, or James. whoever. But actually, James. it was James. How did he know this? He went to lots of evidence. To I'm not going to go into it. It's now although it's available. And Jesus, sorry, James was head of the Jerusalem church until uh, probably 1960-ish, uh, when he died, when he was murdered. Um, so for decades, yeah. he was the head of he's, the church. And James's faith. If, if you go to pretty much any l l list of bishops of Jerusalem, when they go back, they say James is the first bishop. And they said that all of the uh, the Christians who were bishops of Jerusalem were Jewish Christians up until the Bar Kokhba r r revolt. So 135. Um... So yeah, no, that's not a a mystery. Well, well, Peter was the bishop of Antioch, then uh, Rome, and Paul was important in Rome, and and Mark was in Alexandria. James was in Jerusalem. Like again, why are you putting them against each other? There's no need to put this against each other. It's the, it's converging evidence, not stuff you. Put James's you. Christianity was very different from that of Paul, according to our evidence, oh. about what he believed about his brother. Did he think his brother was God? No. <laughs> Did he think by believing in his brother, you become Satan? No. What was James? Oh. He was a Jew. I mean, he was a practicing <laughs> Jew. He was an Orthodox Jew. He Jewish Orthodoxy, really? That's so anachronistic. He didn't eat pork. He didn't believe, agree with Paul. See, by the way, it, it, it's it's so funny when the Muslims try to say, well, Jesus didn't, didn't eat pork. The Muslims don't eat pork. Jesus abstained from 31 different animals found in the Torah. The Muslims abstained from one out of 31. In fact, in fact, um... Oh, hey, Paul, just about to wrap up here. See, see Paul, I, 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 I'm going to share you a, a double standard that the Muslims use. Jesus didn't eat pork. Muslims don't eat pork, but Christians do. How come they don't? How come the Christians aren't following that? Um, well, for, first of all, m m Muslims have no problem eating 30 out of the 31 uh, prohib prohibited foods in the Torah. Example, camel. You can't eat camel according to the Torah, so Jesus would not have. But camel is eaten as food uh, in a bunch of M Middle Eastern countries like Egypt, which is 90% Muslim and close to 100 million people. They eat camels. Jesus would never have done that. What about uh, in in uh, in UAE and Qatar? They eat camels there. Saudi Arabia, they eat camels. In fact, in Saudi Arabia, there was a m m a movement to abolish camel eating. Uh, I don't think it succeeded, but the point is there w w w was a movement, not because of what Jesus or the Torah said but because from a modern animal rights point of view. So, I mean, I don't know. It's like, yeah, whoa, yeah, we didn't eat pork. How about the other 30 foods? So you are one for 31. Let's, uh, let's uh, uh, do some, I'm not a math major. Uh, so we'll, actually, I, I have an engineering degree. I'm pretty good at math, but um, one divided by 31. 3.2%. You guys have a 3.2% in following. Or you could do what the Gospel of Mark says. Jesus declared all foods clean. Boom. Problem solved. All that you could eat anything, like Paul says in his letters. Jesus declared all foods clean in Mark. No, you don't talk. You don't eat stuff that's not kosher or not halal, etc. I can go the whole list. Now, I'm not making this up. The evidence is there, and uh, I'm not going to go into it, I don't have time. Anyway, this book uh, I recommend by a guy called Jeffrey Butts, he's an ordained 
Lutheran minister and a professor of world religions at Penn State. He's an ordained fraud. Uh, Penn State University in the States. So uh, I read that it's actually very readable, and he draws on a lot of recent scholarship um, to talk about this issue. So James was the first leader of the church, not Peter, as the Catholics would have you believe. And that's just history. It's not totally. Well, you notice he's not quoting any history. Um, anyway, probably said enough, so I'll leave it there. All right, very. Uh, all right, we're, we're done. Very selective with the evidence. There's still Q and A. I will do that a few days from now. Um, I'm going to recommend a book, "The Case for Jesus" by Brant Petrie. It's the antidote to all of that trash Paul Williams wants you to read. Again, I have nothing against Paul Williams. It's just that it's sad that he got snowed by this stuff. And it's also sad that he only applied it to one faith, higher criticism. Uh, he didn't apply those standards to Islam. If you watch the 2008 or 9 or 6 or whatever converts debate between uh, Paul Williams and Nabil Qureshi, basically Nabil Qureshi's whole argument is like you held Christianity to an impossible standard while you held Islam to no standards. So, all right, I, I, I'm off. It's uh, 10.40 p.m. here, so uh, I'm going to get some shut-eye. I don't have to work tomorrow, but, but I'm getting pretty tired either way. So, um, so I'm out, and I want everyone here to, uh, to have a good day, and God bless. If you're a, a Muslim, think about this stuff, pray about this stuff. And you can uh, uh, you can contact me. In fact, John Color Offie. Anything is history as long as he gets to decide which horses are right. Yeah. No. Um. It it it's and and, and again, most of these crazy liberals don't go to Islam. Why? Because they apply the same standard to both faiths. And they come out that both are bogus. Of course, if you imply the impossible standards to, to any faith on earth, it's going to happen. So that's what Paul Williams did. So pray for Paul Williams that he will permanently apostatize from Islam, not just temporarily, and come back to Jesus Christ. Um, but I do have to go now. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. And... Um, I w will come back in a few days to do Q and A, and I will see you then. And and please join me then. You will see a lot more of the double standards and selective cherry picking. All right, bye.